Maynard Webb, thank you for sitting down for Fort Knox. You've got this new book, Dear Founder, Letters of Advice for Anyone Who Leads, Manages, or Wants to Start a Business. And it's literally written like letters to yep. a founder. Where did the idea come from? I have to credit my son for the idea. He had read, first of all, thank you for having me on the show, John. Love being here. And I have to credit my son for the idea. He had read a Medium post that was about a father who was dying. Turns out it was fake. But he, he wrote his son a bunch of letters about every stage of his life because he wasn't going to be there. Hmm. So the first time your mom's mad at you, open this letter. Remember, she's going through a tough time too. When you have your first date, here's how I want you to behave. When you're getting married, the last one was, when you're about to die and you open the letter and it says, I, I hope you're old <laughs> and I'll see you soon. Um, but the point was, we run into this with our companies all the time and you know, I've had a long career and people have been really good to me in my career and I've learned a lot. So I spend all my time trying to give back now mm -hmm. and we have founders that are thrilled that we're around to give advice and I have 90 people that invest by my side, but they get connected and they get the advice, but the other 99 companies we have in our portfolio don't hear that advice. So we decided that we could codify some of this advice in this letter format based on the stage of the company you're in. Um, and sometimes when you're a baby company, you don't need to hear about being a legacy company because it's too soon. And sometimes when you're a legacy company, the stuff that happens at the beginning of the book isn't that happy. So we wrote it so that you could go anytime, so anywhere to whatever need. section you need yeah. to get actionable advice. Now, you've been, uh, in leadership positions at LiveOps, at eBay as chief operating officer, you're chairman of Yahoo, you've been on the board at Visa, at, I mean, I, I could name a, a bunch so, of yeah, places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah lot, lots. Um, over all that period of time, what do you think are the things that leaders, that founders miss the most? Where, where they could say, oh, if I could go back and do differently at this, here's what it would be. I think people and culture, two things. Huh. Everything's about people at the end of the day, no matter how great an idea and how good a strategy you have, you still have to have people to carry it off and finding the right people right. and motivating and inspiring them is important. And then on the culture side, I think you, you have a culture whether you know it or not. And so paying attention to it from the beginning is really important. And you think most founders tend to not pay as much attention to those things as they should? Or, or they pay attention to things they think matter, like free food, and not as much to how you treat somebody. And when somebody comes in, how do you welcome the first salesperson instead of harangue them that they're not engineers? Or hmm. how do you treat diversity and make sure that you tackle that from the beginning instead of once you're like 50 or 100 people? Are, are these things where founders tend to think, well, I just kind of assumed that this would um, emanate out from me because I care about it, even though I never really talked well, about it that much? Well, some of them, some of them care, and some of them don't. Care. Like, okay. well, it's not that they don't care, but they're like, frankly, when you're starting a company, if you try to do everything everybody thinks you should do as a CEO, you'll do nothing, and you better make a product that somebody wants or nobody is going to be around. Mm. So they're pretty maniacally focused on building. Um, and they don't often understand, some of them do from the beginning, that they want to build it with all these good things in, but often they don't realize that they have to do it. Many of them haven't been managers or leaders before. So it's a pretty tough job to go, now I'm the CEO, now I have a board, how do I manage them? How do I manage my employees? How do I handle all of this? Some, I had, do you, is it okay if I tell a story? Sure. So I had, a, um, I had uh, some people that went on to do great things, but they came to see me early on when they had like seven people. And wh what position were you in when they came to see you? Uh, no, I'm an investor. An and investor, an, right. an, an advisor. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> I made a special arrangements to see them in between a, a big Yahoo meeting and the Salesforce board meeting. And they came and they said, we have a big problem. I'm like, okay, 
lay it on me. And they go, we have this person who's really bad that we need to fire, but we are worried that if we fire him, people will be upset because his dog everybody loves and he's a culture carrier. I'm like, really? Mm. Uh, and they said, yeah, really, we were really worried. I'm like, this is easy, fire him, keep the dog. But no. <laughs> but, but no, honestly, you have to find a way to let it go and explain to people what's going on. They've since grown to be, you know, several hundred people and they're fine. But that was, they didn't even know how to address a performance problem, which is pretty, pretty interesting. So you have those sort of experiences that people are learning how to do. And they have to build a product and they have to make everybody happy. Yeah. Um, I, I'm fascinated by the jumps in people's resumes. And th there's one in yours. You went to Florida Atlantic University yep. for a degree in criminal justice. Absolutely. And then after you graduated, you worked as a security guard at IBM. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what year was that? that and was then what did you well, do so in between <laughs> that, that and, and, and all the managing other stuff. a technology yeah, yeah, yeah. company? Well, yeah. I, I had been appointed to Annapolis and didn't go out of high school, which drove my mom crazy. Why didn't you go? Um, I had grown long hair and it uh -huh. sounded like a long, back when I had hair, and sounded like <laughs> We can a all very, sing that yeah, song, yeah, yes. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> sounded like a very long commitment um, with the multiple years, and so I just went home, worked full-time, went to school full-time, majored in criminal justice, was gonna go to law school, but I, I made, it was in Boca Raton, and IBM hired me as a co-op student, making a very nice, they paid security guards very well, and then they offered me a full-time job in Rochester um, with all kinds of overtime and like Sundays was double time and I was on second shift times 10. So making more than like what you could make in a professional job. Mm -hmm. And they told me they were trying to hire talented kids to go do other things and they'd teach you how to program. And so uh, within a year I was managing uh, security people and pretty soon thereafter I had to start teaching myself to code and I went to a number What year was that? That was 1981-82. Why did you care about coding in 1981-82? Because 82? I was that at wasn't... IBM and I knew that was going to be a path out to... Out of? Of doing hourly work and uh -huh. on the, I wanted to be a professional and I could see where that came from and so I volunteered... What had given you that, what had given you that vision? Was, was there people, were there people you had seen in your life who... I have so many people that have, well, my dad, uh, who I lost early when he was seven, uh, when I was seven years old, he uh. passed away and he had his own business. Yeah. And he had a suit that he'd wear to work every day and we'd go pick him up into one family car and I was like, I want an office like that and I want to, uh, I want to wear a suit. Unfortunately, by the time I, and I wore suits early in my career at IBM, but by the time where we are now, nobody wears suits anymore <laughs> for the most part. But um, so I always wanted uh, to be, I thought if I could be a manager, that would be so cool. I love people. And so I took every job in the early days that nobody else wanted. So one of those was being a computer security hacker back hmm. in 1983. And After you learned to code? Yeah. and. Uh, the job was open and my boss wouldn't let me do it. He goes, you're not qualified. And I'm like, nobody else is doing it. I'll do my, I'm doing my regular job. Let me do this one. So I'll get out of here, Webb. And you know, um, <laughs> I'd knock on his door the next week and say, I, I can do that for free. I'm not asking for a promotion. Just let me do the job. And was that the, the white hat hacker who basically yes. comes in yeah, yeah. And, and tries, tries to, to find, find yeah. weaknesses in the yes. system before the real bad guys do? Yeah, it. absolutely. Well, we didn't even call them white hat hackers back then, <laughs> but exactly. <laughs> and I uh, finally, somebody from corporate, I had done another project and he thought I was pretty good. And he said, give that web kid a chance. And so within about a year, I was traveling all over IBM. They'd send me out for a week and say, go see what you can break which was pretty amazing, right? Yeah, and did you break anything good? I broke a lot. I've cut <laughs> checks for more than you can, I gave them all back, which is how I kept in my career. But, uh, <laughs> um, and then I got asked to take a job back in Florida, in Boca, during the heyday. They were losing truckloads of PCs uh, and they didn't know they were stolen. And the police would call 
um, because Boca was a little bit of the wild, wild west back then and IBM and they asked me to come be the guy that tied all their systems together and make sure they had financial accuracy. Mm -hmm. Again, I had no background in that, but I did it and won all kinds of awards for that. And my next job was being a product guy at a local area network after I got through IBM and got hired, left IBM and went on to that. I did a product management job where I'd never been a product manager before. <laughs> so I just keep doing jobs that I wasn't qualified to do. Tell me more about <coughs> your... I don't know if that's helpful, but... It is, it is. But tell, tell me more about your family and your upbringing, because uh, something like losing your dad at seven has to um, have an enormous impact on you. Your, your outlook on what you want to do and, and where you set the bar, um, your feelings about the family that you have that right. remains, your goals. How did you process that and what was the home life like that that kind of motivated and shaped this kid who was willing to push beyond what you were asked to do and what you felt into what you felt like needed to be done well I had an amazing mother and I wish she were still around and it devastated us you know we had five kids wow. we went from fairly well off he left no life insurance to really having a hard time when our water heater broke, we couldn't replace it for years, so I took showers at, the, at, at school, and <coughs> so at least I played sports, so I got the good showers. Mm. <coughs> and um, you went from dreams to knowing it was gonna be on you to make anything work, but my mom instilled in all of us an unbelievable work ethic and work to keep us humble, and also told us we could do anything Mm. But we were going to have to do it on our own. She couldn't help us. But then she went back and became big in the school system and was the teacher of the year for the state of Florida. Wow. And so she became accomplished in her own right. We watched that happen. But we were pretty, like, I know you have young kids. I would say we probably had way more freedom than we probably should have. <laughs> uh, and. But I came out of there with a lot of drive. Yeah. And I didn't want to ever leave my family in the same place my dad left me. Sure. Um, fast forward, and, and we've talked about um, graduating from school, getting started at IBM, and kind of pushing for more responsibility. The first thing, the first entrepreneurial effort that you pushed for, what was it? What, what did you want it to be? Well, <clears throat> when I was, the, before I got to IBM, and I was working my way through school, mm. I uh, was working at a nursery called Patrick's Nursery in West Palm Beach, Florida. Plants <clears throat> and or were, kids? Hmm? Plants or kids? Plants. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and by the way, it's pretty uh, tough work because you have black plastic on the ground and you're picking plants up and delivering them and the, everything's beating down, but the Patrick's were really good to me and all that good stuff. But I thought, they were a wholesale company and I, I told them that I would on weekends do a retail shop for them. And so they let me create a retail business that we would put signs out and advertise and have people come in and buy plants at twice what we sold wholesale so we didn't get any, into any channel conflict. And so I did that for a couple of years, which was pretty awesome huh. while then, I was in college. And then a after that in tech, what was the first entrepreneurial effort? I would say, um, wow, I've done so many. I think that um, a more recent one is at my advanced age, I created a company from scratch. Not my wind funding I created from scratch, which was fun. Right. But I also created Everwise, which was a mentoring company based on an idea I had and I had to find a CEO and that was a lot of fun. But we did that just a few years ago. But I think what I tried to do, it's all on how you define entrepreneurial, but I was always trying to break records. Hmm. Like in IT, we did, in 1995, we did the world's fastest SAP implementation in a big bang way and got recognized by the Smithsonian. And we, you know, it was just, most people were failing those days and trying to do it. It sounds 
kind of normal to do it today, but back then people were blowing up as they were trying sure. to do it. Yeah. And to do it from start to finish in nine months was pretty amazing. Yeah, SAP, you know, the systems that help oh, you yeah. actually run, run the, the pieces company, yes. of your yeah, business. Yep. And if you could get that right, the idea being you could be you so could build, efficient, yep. you'd be able to race ahead yep. of everybody else. Um, you were chairman at Yahoo. Yes. During a period of time where the headlines were fast and furious. Uh, Marissa Meyer uh, was the CEO for part of that time yep. under intense scrutiny. All my time at being chairman, she yes. was CEO. Um, that's not a, a time when you were dealing with a founder, but it is a time when you're dealing with somebody who's trying to reinvent. Absolutely. And kind of refound well, I think in a sense. Way, way, way harder than starting from scratch and doing something. Why right? is that? Why is well, it harder? because you've already hit, uh, you have a lot, well, you have more assets for sure than you do when you're starting a company. Uh, Jerry Young had done a beautiful thing and invested in Alibaba, and, but that is now worth way much, way more than your base business. And by the way, your base business hasn't grown and you have Facebook and Google that have blown way past in growth. So. How are you going to reignite that growth while at the same time you have the investors that want the tax relief from this big investment that gets bigger, you know, in, in worth? So it was complicated, but you had a lot of assets there and a lot of good people and a great leader. So um, sometimes you say hindsight is 2020, but in this case, I don't even know if hindsight is that clear. Even looking back now, what we know about how social has developed, how mobile has evolved, you know, things in the cloud, what could you do if you're taking over Yahoo at that stage to, to help it out of that rut it was in and, and help it to grow? Well, I think that's why we hired Marissa, because we felt she was a visionary product leader that had have made a lot of impact, and she certainly introduced a lot of good new products, bought some companies, and were taking a run but um, the path was pretty steep and we just ran out of time and felt we had to sell the, the core business and separate out the uh, financial assets from the core business and that's sure. what we ended up doing. Now it's part of Verizon and yep. not under the same kind of scrutiny and uh, yeah, yeah um, they're, they're managing that in a different way. eBay, when the e-commerce revolution first kicked off, People looked at eBay and said, now that's the perfect business model. Yep. Uh, so lots of profit, don't have to mess with that. No inventory. Do, yeah, yeah, logistic totally. stuff and inventory, eBay versus Amazon. What, what was it like? Um, it was amazing. Yeah. Actually, super energizing. And we were, well, I started once they hit a few technical problems. <laughs> there, I was the person Meg brought in to try to, and my team to, make sure that we don't have the site crash <laughs> frequently and uh, stunt our growth. So it's pretty hard work in the early year or two to actually make sure that that was a non-event, right? And what so year was that? I joined in 1999. 1999. And, um, we had to work all day the uh, New Year's Eve because we were certain, you know, I had asked when I joined, do we have a Y2K problem? No, all our code's new. Turns out we had a massive Y2K problem. <laughs> we kept the site up. <laughs> we were certain it was all going to blow up on that day, and it blew up other times frequently. And so we finally got that fixed. And that, we didn't have a lot of time to understand how good things were, because we were just working all-nighters to try to keep everything glued together and get ahead of the scale issue, which we did. But it was, it was such a beautiful time because we were growing so fast and we learned about community we were breaking new snow we were doing things nobody in the world had ever done before mm. and how can that not be fun right. right but then we have to figure out when i started i think we had a couple of hundred people in the company when i left 14 or 15 thousand and countries all over and we had bought paypal and uh, i'd become the coo it was it the day didn't go by that it, we didn't just have a blast Mm. And there were tough moments in there, but it was a lot of fun. Um, kind of similar to Meg Whitman. Meg isn't known 
primarily as a founder. No, she came in after Pierre. Yeah. Pierre brought her in. Yeah. And, and then she went into HP. Now she's working with she's Jeff She's a founder. Katzenberg, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, on this, on this uh, video venture. But uh, is, is there something of the founder mindset, even if you're not technically the founder of the organization oh. that you're in? If you're a leader or even if you're an influencer, I think that you can get Absolutely, because this, this book, book that you've written. This book covers from the idea, which founders have, to making it relevant, which means the world wants it, and scaling it, which is making it big, right? That's not about being the founder, it's scaling it. Mm. And then creating a legacy company, uh, HP legacy company, hopefully Salesforce legacy company, hopefully eBay, that you're going to be around for generations, right? So certainly you, that will be helpful for people at any of those stages. But I also think um, whether it was Meg, Marissa was engineer, first female engineer at, at Google. Google. Yeah. Meg joined when there were less than, I think, 60 people in eBay very early and was their first CEO there, you know, in the founding ethos. And I can tell you that both of them operate pretty much like founders with the way they think and the way they try to go do things. Uh, you, you mentioned Salesforce. That's the company I didn't mention that you're on the board of. Um, Mark Benioff, we found out uh, a few days ago, has, with his wife, bought Time Magazine, uh, which is another brand that I suppose needs to be refounded in some uh, ways. Uh, I, well, I think they're doing very, very well. Uh, I think it's awesome, and I'm happy for Mark and Lynn that they're investing in that iconic global brand. Mm. Fascinating. Um, how have you talked to him about that? I mean, Silicon Valley during certain periods has gone through being sort of allergic to content. You know, it's not as scalable is, as it, tech in some ways, but that's changed over I time. Have, we've had communication, and what I do know is that there is no connection to Salesforce on this. This is a personal investment that is being managed by their family. And I think they'll be great stewards of this iconic brand. Um, what does it say about the kind of impact that Silicon Valley founders, entrepreneurs, this tech uh, wealth and capital that has been created, the impact it can have on the world when uh, the likes of a Benioff or a Bezos or, yeah. or others can invest in these communication brands and sort of shape the way information is gathered, dispersed, the, the view that people have on the world. Well, frankly, I don't know what drove Mark to want to own this, and hopefully he'll come on your show and tell you why he wanted to do that. Um, but what I can say is that many of the folks in tech feel an obligation to help do good things in the world. You know, that's why we get jazzed about building new products and new capabilities. And then when you do that, we have to make sure that it's used for good things in the world. So I think there's something that ties to all that. Um, final thought, uh, if I'm going to read one section of this book that you feel like is advice you wish that you had had at a crucial point in your career, where would I flip to? I would, I would go to uh, when you need to find synchronicity. Okay. When I and, need to find and the reason is there's always more things that can happen if you're open to them. And I, I tell a story there about how I was assigned to try to fix the culture at eBay. Uh -huh. And I got off the rails a little bit with how I started it and it blew up. But then I found a book that changed my life and uh, changed Megs in my life. And then we redid it together. What book was that? It was called Radical Change, Radical Results by Kate Ludeman, huh. um, who was an executive coach kind of person. Uh, and I walked around with a massive chip on my shoulder from my background, which you brought up today. And I never talked about it. And I never uh, was, I wasn't that inspiring. I was a get stuff done person that was in the trenches and made it all happen. And I, I had to learn that there was much more of me that I should do and never dreamed about writing books and creating new companies, and my whole life changed as a result of that. So if there's one letter, that might be the one. 
Well, fantastic. I will look for it. Uh, the book is Dear Founder, Letters of Advice for anyone who leads, manages, or wants to start a business. Maynard Webb, thanks for sitting down with me. Thank you for being here. That was awesome. Thank you.